terms, what is the difference between automated buying and yeah, programmatic? That's great. Uh, automation for us is more about giving both the buyer and the sellers better tools to do their jobs in a more immediate um, and transparent fashion. So a great example is if you're doing a media buy for a television market, um, in, in our platform, you can get the information that you desire in terms of the rates and the ratings in a very short window of time, uh, you know, by both either reaching out to the sales agent or sales rep who's working on that account or going in the system itself, whereas that process can take sometimes hours or days or, you know, a little bit less of a week to gather and garner all that information. That's just one of the effects. Cool. Well, I'm sure we'll talk more about programmatic, but Gerard, let's go back to you with the original question. What is something that we talk about a lot in the industry that nobody's actually doing yet? Well, I would have to echo on the programmatic. I, I think what people need to understand is that TV is still a scarcity market, right? And so until uh, a large part of that inventory shifts over to those automated systems, uh, what you'll see is probably incremental uh, push of programmatic into the marketplace. Uh, from a Nielsen perspective, we need to support all systems, so we're, you know, we're putting data into all systems. Uh, I echo Brad's piece. I think overall, without going into true programmatic, there's a lot of overhead where we can automate, and that will set the table for more programmatic down the line. And you're seeing uh, also the ad model discussions happening right now, uh, where traditional linear versus dynamic, uh, w which could really speed the adoption of pro programmatic happening at the national level. I know there's ad summits, NBC just recently announced that they want to look at how they can insert dynamic in their traditional linear, mm -hmm. and Nielsen is supporting that uh, via recent announcement. So, um, but at the same time, we see a lot of innovation in, in uh, dynamic experimentation, especially at the local level, uh, where you, know, you have cable companies and, and satellite companies doing addressable uh, but not really programmatic. And maybe that goes back to, you know, the control of that inventory, mm -hmm. right? And let's face it, there's a concern about, you know, lowering the cost per point too far where they lose control of, of their revenue stream. So. Steve, to Simple. You. Um, and it's not only in, in the world of politics, but it's in the world of advertising as a whole. When I speak to advertisers across a broad stretch of categories, what do they want? Personalization in premium content at scale. Now, everybody's got one of those, but nobody has all of those, and we're not there yet. What do we have? We have scale, we have premium content, but we don't have the personalization, but it's coming. In three or four years, we're gonna be moving to a new broadcast standard called ATSC 3.0, which um, in very simple terms, I'm not a big technology guy, I wanna know what the business case is and what it does for advertisers, but in simple terms, it's a broadcast IP signal. So we'll be able to provide a, in one shot, be able to get, reach a mass audience and target on a device level. Um, and it's already being done in Korea, that's why I am, uh, I'm pretty bullish about it. It's already been done in Korea, where they're already moved to 3.0. So the chips are being put in the devices of LG and Samsung, and now others are getting the chips put in it also. Uh, we're going through a repack now, I think a lot of you know, and I won't get into a lot of uh, in you know, a lot of detail on it, but the spectrum auction. So all the stations are putting the equipment in so that they can actually go through those signals. There are tests being done now in Phoenix, Cleveland, and Dallas um, to uh, not only the technology tests are being done, but the advertising tests are being done. Um, so we're very bullish on it, but I don't want to overpromise anything. This is a good three or four years away. So just before we go to the next question, Angie, you're the only one on the panel who actually buys media. So you've got a bunch of us up here talking about the industry, <laughs> and you actually do it. So what do you make of some of these answers, and how do you think it'll change the way that you do your job in the next three to five years to use the time frame they're using? It'll be interesting to see how all the political rate levels are incorporated into these systems yeah. and the complexity of it. Um, it would also be, you know, how can we scale this now? I mean, we're, we're talking about 2018 and 2020. Things that are coming in three to four years, I think we'll have a better projection of that coming up, but we have to work with what we have now. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, been a, it's been a chicken and the egg kind of thing. That's the one thing I will say. Both sides know they're ready for this. Both sides know that they need to get their people ready for this, because that's the other 
misnomer is that the people go away. It's about putting the people in the right place and giving them the power to make smart decisions mm -hmm. and make better decisions. But the challenge is it's a chicken and the egg. And I think we're only now getting to the point where both the buy and the sell side are saying, all right, we're going to start to push our chips on the table. It's very good for television that this occurs, particularly local broadcast. And, and folks that are involved in the political space understand this. It is the deepest, richest pool of quality impressions and quality content out there. And so giving it an edge to continue to reinvent itself is, is going to be really important in the next 12 to 18 months. So just as, as a quick follow-up to this topic, um, how does the, the unique nature of the political market impact application? So not only is all of our media that we buy local, which of course that, that's what we do, and it's different to deploy something nationally than it is locally, but also political campaigns and political buyers like Angie are bringing their own first-party data that they're matching to various data sets that is not available to the sell side. So you talk about a partnership between buy and sell side, but in politics specifically, we're leveraging data on the, on the buy side that the sell side doesn't have access to. So how does that impact from a, from a process standpoint how this will work? That goes to all three yeah. of you. All right. Go ahead. I think the immediate challenge is on the audience, as Brad mentioned this, we need to have consistent audience definitions uh, that can go across that, that gap right now from the sell side to the buy side. Uh, you may have... Sorry, real quick. Do you want that, Angie? No, I don't want consistent audience. I want my specific audience. audience I want right. custom audiences. Right. We don't need to reach a mass. We need to reach a very small subset of And that. let me be, uh, I'm not really disagreeing yeah. with you. I'm, I'm talking about how you build <laughs> those custom definitions. Are they really, truly built in a way that you can trust them? What we're seeing in different media, specifically on the digital side, uh, we're not talking about, you know, uh, the viewing aspect of it, but the audience. Are you actually reaching that custom audi audience that you uh, intend to, right? What we're seeing is, especially with large data sets, uh, people tend to just say, well, they're kind of industry accepted, they're off the shelf, they're good. Um, one example that, that Nielsen has seen is, you know, around uh, ethnic and racial Hispanics. Uh, we have looked and, and compared against our very deep, knowledgeable, but limited in scale uh, panels. And what we found was that Hispanic in one congressional district in Florida was off by, you know, six to 10 percent. That's large. What right? do you mean off? Off meaning that when we compared an actual cable or satellite home where you have lots of viewing, right, and you take it at, uh, in mass and then compare it to uh, homes that we actually go in, knock on the door, go in and ask them what they're ethnic and ask them uh, Spanish speaking or not, or a mix, what we saw from off the shelf was off by six to 10% Got versus it. a validation. Set. So real quick on your point that you, that advertisers need audiences that they can trust. Yes. In politics specifically, usually they're bringing their own audience to the table where they're not trusting the sell side to build the audience for them, but instead they're, they're employing targeters, micro-targeting campaigns, voter scores, et cetera, to build their own audiences that they can know and trust, and that's what they're bringing to the table. Well, as long Are as you saying that they shouldn't trust those audiences, no, that you know better? No, no, no. What I'm saying is when they define them, how do you map that to the media, right? Mm -hmm. and, and media says, well, yeah, I'm reaching Hispanics. You define Hispanics this way, ABC, and I'm reaching them. Well, yeah. how do you validate that? And, and I, I think that the difference from where I sit on this panel is I can't tell you what's right or wrong for a data set. I can only judge myself by how happy both parties are in the transaction mm -hmm. and what it results in. You know, uh, there was a big announcement a few months ago by Sinclair and Nexstar and Tribune and Tegna and Hearst called the TIP Initiative. And for somebody on my side, the TIP Initiative is basically a series and set of open standards that allows different people with different closed-end systems to have APIs and allow them all to talk to each other. We love that. Open up the ecosystem so you have full transparency. So if she wants to buy a data set that is your data set, you can do it in an open environment without necessarily showing what you're looking for in a way that's going to tip your cards. That's where the marketplace has to go. There has to be checks and balances. There has to be the appropriate calls on what different data sets are, but if you buy a certain audience and you're really happy about it, I'm not in the business of telling you whether that audience is right or wrong. I'm in the business of giving you all the tools to make sure it's the best transaction you've possibly had. 
and, and that's really kind of the transitioning that needs to happen in the industry. So, so real, just real quick, I just, I just want to say you guys all came for a TV panel. You're getting a data panel, which Sorry. makes me very proud. Uh, our industry has come a long way in the last five years, so, so that's, that's great. What do you make of this? You, you represent local broadcast. You have a lot yep. of research on the effectiveness of local broadcast TV. So you hear all this conversation about audiences, about programmatic, about automation. What's your take love on it. all that? Absolutely love it. I mean, uh, you know, I think the more and more we get data, the more and more you're going to see that TV's not overvalued, it's undervalued. Um, there are so many, and I'll get into some case studies in a second, because my two favorite categories are political and automotive, because you, in political, you either win or lose, right? You're the number two brand, you lose. In automotive, you see dealers, and, you know, they're tough guys, and it's like I ran a schedule, and did people come into my dealership? But I'm going to build off both of them. One, I'm going to give a shout out to Nielsen first, is that you know, they have the data sets. Now they're getting into, in the, in the diary markets, they're putting in electronic measurement. So they're going to have the return path data. So as long as we understand what the target you want, it's, it's not that difficult for us to get that data and make you more targeted overnight. I mean, that can happen now. Um, what Brad was talking about in terms of standard APIs, which was, uh, you know, we. We at the TVB kind of were the genesis of that project with my fellow colleague out there, Abby Sorry, Arbat. Man. That's all right, yeah, no sorry, problem. Sorry. It seems like our membership seems to forget that once in a while. <laughs> but, um, but to your point, the idea was, yeah. and, and another shout out to Vidya, because you were right on top of it and said this is great, was we have to provide a common language for everyone to communicate with one another. If we all are on different platforms and we can't communicate, and you know, you're speaking French and I'm speaking Italian and you, we can't find a common language, then it's worthless. And I think that's why the API project is so important, because now we can start communicating with one another, and then we can start trading those, those data sets. But getting back to your question to me, um, you know, why I love this category, it's very simple. You either win or you lose. So either your media is effective or it's not effective. And I'll give you a case study that happened in another category, this automotive category, um, that just recently came out. It was from a... a uh, regional agency called Sonic, uh, excuse me, called Strong Advertising. And they actually use Sonic, which is a, a dealership, but they use one of their dealerships. It was a Toyota dealership in a big market. And they decided they were going to do the ultimate test. They're going to pull all TV advertising out. In September, one of their biggest months of the year, they decided we're not going to do TV anymore. Let's see what happens. So what happened? Well, all their direct and organic traffic went down 20%. Searches went down 28%. They don't care about that. What happened to sales? Sales went down 21%. So let's put TV back into the mix and see what happens. All those numbers reversed. In fact, sales went up 25% and searches went up 28%. So what I say is it's not television or. It's television and. You should be doing that. And by the way, we got great assets we'd love to sell on the digital front. Over the top assets, whatever you want. I mean, we can do that. So it's really television and. And then one day we'll get to what we really want to get to with the new um, broadcast standard, where we'll be able to provide you that personalization at scale. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time talking about some things that aren't yet working. Um, so I'm going to reverse the question. What's a smart thing that each of you or your organizations are working on that is going to have a tangible impact on political races in 2018, which all the people in this room are, are working on. Angie, we'll start with you. I think being more strategic with the data and being able to find an audience efficiently and effectively and make an impact with them. Great. Yeah, we're, we're doing some really kind of initial tests with a couple of agencies. We're very candid about the fact that LUR, in-window, these are serious items that we respect how- Sorry, real quick. For people lowest who are not buyers. Rates, lowest unit yes. rates, the rules around the election, and when you can buy what rates. Uh, I'm, I'm looking over at Jeff over here who's shaking his head at me. But the, the end of the day, um, there are certain rules that govern TV and broadcast that we have to be very respectful and careful of because it is our customer's FCC license. So we are doing a lot on the automation up front. We are doing a lot on giving our test companies um, tools to track the performance and how the orders are running. Uh, but we are being careful about it because we know this is a big deal to both, obviously, the, uh, the agencies, the candidates, and, and our station customers. I think scale uh, scales coming across uh, all media, whether it's digital or TV. Uh, I think within TV itself, uh, scales coming uh, 
Steve, you mentioned, you know, we, we're dropping uh, impact data and, and soon in the summer, uh, we're gonna be converting all the diary markets to return path data, which is gonna give scale. Uh, but that allows uh, the ecosystem to really run without a lot of the uh, range that traditionally it's been there, mm -hmm. especially for those people who do rely on, on Nielsen. Um, but I do think there's also progress on the addressable side. While not be fully automated, you're seeing a lot of different and innov innovative ways to target. They may not be gelling together, they still might be siloed, uh, and it's more work to connect them. But in the future, I think they'll be a lot more seamless and, and transparent uh, to the API uh, conversation. So uh, I, I just think we're not at the beginning. We're kind of in the middle. Um, when I'm down in Washington, D.C., meeting several people in this audience, the biggest question I get is, what should my mix be? What's the best allocation? And there are some advertising in the general area, especially in the consumer packaged goods area where they've done it. And it's around 80, 20, but it varies. It varies on how much money you have, it varies on what market you're in, et cetera. So what we did um, to try and help that, because it's about time and influence. At the end of the day, that's what this comes down to. What's, what, where are people spending their time and what most influences them? So at the last election, uh, we took 10 of the most competitive states and did a full study. We took what was normally called a consumer purchase funnel. How do people go through the path of buying a product and turn it to a voter funnel? How did I become aware of a candidate, interested, considered, did something about it, went, to the, went on the web, watched a debate, whatever it might be, and actually voted to show them the influence of different media? And you can you know, figure out, I mean, we were, quite frankly, Tobin's the 800 pound gorilla across all of those. You could add up the influence of other media, didn't add up to TV, but the importance of social at the end of the, at the end of the tunnel, the importance of digital at the end of the tunnel. Um, now, some of those things that are happening now, like OTT, we just don't know yet, because it's really in its infancy, and it's a bit of a wild, wild west right now, OTT. But that's what we've been trying to do, is help answer the question, what should my allocation be? So a, a word that's come up a few times uh, is addressable. We talk about addressable a lot in TV. Um, I'd be curious to hear each of you give me a definition of addressable TV, uh, because it seems like we have a lot of different ones. And then within that definition, how available is it at the local level for political, and then at, at what scale? We'll start with you. Um, addressable to me, I think there's two types of TV, and I think they kind of mix up the definition. There's advanced TV, is what we talked about, where you take data and you put it onto viewership, and you could say, this show, this genre, seems to drive these type of voters. That's one. Addressable is where you target to a household, where you say, okay, I want to watch this household because they have these type of behaviors that I want to reach, or they're this type of person that I want to reach for this type of candidate and what they're running or ballot issue and what it is. Availability, not very. It's, we're really not there. You can do some of it in terms of smart TVs right now, but in terms of scale, it's not there yet. So we, there's still work that needs to be done on the local level in terms of addressable linear television. I would probably be a little bit more expansive, not just focus on behaviors, but there are difficult to collect attributes. Uh, in the political world, I'm not an expert, but I do see that information is becoming a lot more available, whether it's first party or, or more generally available. So not just looking at behavior, in, in the linear TV, you can rely on past viewing behavior. That's important. But when you start talking about mix, especially outside of TV or even within TV, you know, linear TV versus OTT and, and, and different di digital TV channels, I think you need to be not looking just at behaviors, but also uh, attributes that you can bring from third party or attributes that you can surface from the data itself. And you can score those households and those persons. Um, it's, it's hard to do, but you do see uh, uh, the cable and, and the uh, satellite companies doing it at the national level, especially in the auto industry. Um, would love to see more of that in the political, right? Where, to your point, you're, you have a winner or a loser, but now you're getting into more direct action. Yes, I want them to vote, but I also want to raise money. I also want them to talk to their neighbor and, and bring them into the fold, right? So how, how can you get those scores? How can you get the influence of that behavior from different attributes? How would you define addressable and how available is it? Uh, I, address, I would say it's kind of a mix. 
what I would say is, first off, I want to say there isn't a lot of meaningful addressable inventory because of the combined definition of the two. It has to be at that household level. It has to be targetable. But you also have to be able to have a high level of confidence of who you're hitting. Right now, when you look at the, the combination of the two, that is one of the biggest drivers for why there isn't a significant pool of this inventory. Because you can get to the household level. You can do a bunch of things. But as you were saying, when you start to try to score and put attributes to it, they've had varying degrees of success in terms of the confidence level of who actually is watching it and when they're watching it. Angie. Addressable for us from the buying side is being able to deliver a message directly to a household in first person. But it is. It's, there's no scale to it. You can't get that same level of reach and frequency behind it. So it's a supplement. It's part of a full mixed media campaign that we, that we do need. So w one thing that didn't come up in our definitions of addressable, unless I missed it, is no one talked about a one-to-one -one match where you can bring a list of first-party data. These are the people I want to talk to. You can match it to providers that have addressable inventory available and insert ads directly to those people. Is that not where the industry is yet in terms of addressable? I don't think so. I mean, look, I'm a huge Yankees fan, and, uh, but you know, nine times out of ten in my household, when the Yankees game is on, it's one of my three kids. So, no, they're, they, there's still a certain, uh, you know, Cable would say last mile, I would say last five yards in multi-person households in understanding the differentiations of who's watching and what's set. I don't think they've solved that yet. Any other thoughts? I think you definitely have to do it as a step. It's, just, it's like Cable says, you have to do that match. What the problem is that you want to be as comprehensive as possible and unbiased, right? So if you're looking at... Uh, a very small congressional district or a, a state rep race, um, you may have a match with a dominant cable provider, but you still might be missing 20 to 30 percent of that TV audience, mm -hmm. right? You may have 100 percent of the audience that you've defined that you want to hit, but if you overlay that, you're going to leave out over the air only, and that may be a majority of the people that you want to hit, right? So. You, yeah, do the match, and uh, it's, again, table stakes, but you have to do so much more than that. Yeah. To Brad's point, how are you really hitting? So, so your point is really that addressable and where it's available with a one-to-one -one match can be an important part of a campaign because of guaranteed viewability that comes with it. However, it is not a standalone advertising campaign. You cannot just say, we're going to run exclusively addressable TV and, and call it good for the day. I, I would defer to Angela, but my thought process, if your immediate positioning is I want to just reach out and reach you, versus rebuilding a scaled bell curve of the people that you want, understanding that you're not going to hit someone eight times with an ad when they're going to be really tired of it after five, then adding in a one-to-one -one match for really focused, high-concentration people, that, that to me feels like success. But again, I'm, I'm a sales enablement platform, so my opinions, <laughs> I step back, I, I defer. No, I would agree. I mean, it, it's still all in combination of what's scalable. You can't isolate out TV only, cable only, addressable only. It has to be seen as a full package together. And, and we just got to be, you know, um, cognizant of the privacy issues out there that you're using a third party, and then it's anonymized because uh, obviously in Washington D.C. that's going to be a bigger, bigger issue. And the question is, what type, if there's going to be any regulation coming out of what's happened this week? So before we open up for audience questions, I have one more question. I already made the joke about the TV panel really being a data panel. So let's say all five of us are back here on this stage at the AAPC in another five years. What are we going to be talking about then? What is how much of this is going to have changed by then, and what's going to be what's going to be the same? We'll start with you. Uh, addressability. We'll be doing addressability at scale, and that's what we'll be talking about. And then how we're going to get smarter in terms of using the data to be to use addressability but it'll be addressability at scale. I agree, but I think hopefully we'll be talking about impact and ROI. Like in the advertising world, that's sales lift, but in the political world, what are they driving? To the voting booth or additional items like fundraising and we call it you know, the ability to influence, right? And so I think those are going to be important metrics that have to be driven in how does addressability and potentially programmatic do that. So you're really good at attribution. Yeah. How would you do, how do you approach attribution in a political world where we still have a private ballot, we don't know how people voted, we do know that they vote, but as you guys in the room know, one of the biggest challenges is that these organizations stop existing at election day, 
So you know, we could spend a bunch of time and money after the election to go back and spend time on attribution, but at that point, you're transitioning, you're, you're trying to move into office, and you're, you're doing a different job. So how do we do that in this industry? That I don't know. <laughs> you, need, you need research minds smarter than us yeah. in terms of how they're going to do attribution modeling. But I, I think, you know, as political uh, campaigns get longer and longer and the cycles get longer and longer, I think it, it has to be a necessary part, right? It has to be a feedback loop. Otherwise, you're just repeating, you know, the last election. The perpetual campaign is good news for all of us in the room who do this for a business, so that's good. I, I think everything changes. I mean, look, four years ago when Sharita and I started this, we had customers grab us by the collar, shake us, and ask us why we were doing it. Now the, they're the people that are out on the uh, streets uh, singing the gospel for what we're doing. I think we're moving into this multi-platform video environment. You're going to have live premium content. You're going to have on-demand content. The measurement system is going to evolve. So I can't think of one thing that I can say other than stays the same, other than the fact that being a subject matter expert, whether it be on the buy side and who you want to reach or the sell side and who you're serving and your customer, that, that uh, salesperson or that analyst or that person who understands it, that and those relationships are going to matter because this is going to get more complicated before it gets less. And so having the right people in the process to manage through with the automation and with the data, I think that to me is the key. Um, you so, I'm not going to beat up digital, but when, the, when everything went machine to machine in RTB, you were seeing fraud levels of 30, 40, 45% in a big portion of the business because no one had their finger on the pulse. No one who was a subject matter expert was able to say, hey, look at that. Oh my God, I can't believe that happened. What's smart about how TV is trying to evolve is we saw that. We are trying to put the right controls in place, whether it be on the data, whether it be on the automation. So having the right people in the right place is going to be critically important. And I think the nice thing is we're setting ourselves up for success there. Andy. I think for me, all these tools are exciting to be able to do my job better. So I want to yeah. see where it all goes. I want to have these things to be able to be more efficient, to have, you know, to stretch a dollar. Four years ago, we just started using more customized data. So that was where we started and look at where we are right now. I see big changes can happen in a short time. Just be interesting to watch how it all evolves. It'll be fun. Mm -hmm. All right, I want to open it up to audience questions. We've got just over 10 minutes left. Wanted to make sure we left some time if all of you have questions. I, I believe Elena here has a microphone, so just raise your hand. You see them. Uh, she'll come by, and uh, you can ask a question for the panel. I can't see anything. Uh, she's going to grab the mic. Any questions out there? God, we were that good? <laughs> <laughs> or we've confused them that much. How are we confused them that much? I would, uh, uh, you got a question, sir. Um, how do you see the adoption of the automated platforms from both the buy side and the sell side as you roll it out? Is, is there acceptance? Is a person like Angie uh, jumping right in and using the platforms? Um, how is that all flowing out? The, for us, I can't speak to our competitors. We, we started out slow. Uh, it has been a significant ramp in the last nine months. Um, but one of the things that we did to simplify it was have both a self-service and a managed service. That in and of itself helps the agency start to get comfortable first with the change in process, second in the change of tools, and there's a person they can pick up the phone and call if there's a problem and solve it in, in real time. So. Our, our adoption is significant. We're seeing um, the, the billings that we're pushing to our customers triple and quadruple quarter over quarter over quarter. So it's, it's a high hurdle rate. Real quick, what, what's, how much are people using this in political, in our specific industry? Zero. Zero. Um, we've had really good conversations with um, political folks, and we expect to do some limited testing with a couple of the firms. But, what we see is, again, there's, there's no second place in political. So you have to make sure that um, you have the right tools in place. We are doing this managed service with a couple of the rep firms in the television industry. And we think that when we do do these political tests that uh, our, our, uh, our friends at Cox Reps are going to be ultimately the ones who are stewarding any of these uh, potential transactions through. Question here. 
Hey, um, all this great stuff and tools depends on big data, satellite, or cable. What about those households that are only over the air, which are not insignificant and tend to be more lower income, minority? What do you do with those voters? Well, from a data perspective, I can tell you that uh, they are not insignificant. I think the largest market with over the air is 33%. That's not chump change, right? That's when you're talking about political, you can't, you can't ignore a third of the market. The other significant trend is, is, is that it's growing. Uh, I know that's counterintuitive with all these channels, but specifically younger audiences, younger homes, who tend to be cord nevers, cord cutters, are adding over the air. So I have yet to see a market where over the air is flatlining or declining. Uh, it's growing, even in the urban areas. So you have to take it into account, regardless of whether it's a, a, a car dealership or political. And they do differ, to your point. But even within the return path world, a dish home is very different than a direct TV home. Example, look at the programming on direct TV, NFL ticket, more high-end, high-def channels. Dish has more Spanish language programming. You need to take that into account, right? Not to say that data is bad or anything like that, but you need to be able to adjust for it in order to make sure that your customized targets, the people you want to reach, are the actual people you're reaching in whatever media data set. But to your point, from a data perspective, uh, over the air is very different and it needs to be accounted for. Uh, from a Nielsen perspective, in our new diary service, we actually rolled out 7,000 new meters just, sorry, households with over 15,000 new meters just to measure over the air. There's not a lot of data out there right now on, on over the air that you have for when you get it from cable systems or, or even virtual MVPDs where you get the data. Um, with ATSC 3.0, when you have the one-to-one, -one, then you'll really know who they are and you can do targeting that way. Uh, but to Gerardo's point, which is an important one, um, the size of the audience continues to grow. And I think what people forget when you look at numbers and they do the work here is that he's talking about primary homes, so homes that only get over-the-air signal. There are a lot of secondary homes that have, like I have, in a digital antenna on my set in our bedroom and it picks up 50 channels, a beautiful signal because it's not compressed, um, but that's not accounted for. If you add that in, I think it's anywhere between probably 27, 28% of the United States has over the air, and it's gotta be accounted for. The data is not great right now in terms of measuring that audience, and there are some data sets you can use for it, but we really get real data when we go to the new um, broadcast um, standard. Real quick on the, on the growth of over the air, you should Google it. There was a great story in the Wall Street Journal about how millennials were finding antennas, and they thought it was a hack into free TV. Um, <laughs> I say that as the millennial on the stage. It's rather embarrassing to, to read, but you should Google it. It's, it's a good laugh. Any other questions out there for us? OK, great. Elena, we'll give you a little bit of time back to get, to get on schedule. So thank you very much to our panel. Thanks to all thank you for attending. Thank, thank you. you. Good job.